Okay. How about this for your audio? Hey everybody, welcome back to the Side by Side Guys Off-Road Podcast. I am Big Z. And I'm Ian with Full Throttle Battery. And we are self-isolating on this podcast this fine Friday afternoon. We are recording this on April 3rd. How are you doing, Ian? Uh, Stir crazy. Yourself? Yeah. Looks like your uh, beard left you for yeah. the countryside or something. You know, I, I with my hair, I, it's just like most things. It was an impulse decision. You know, I'll look at a line or something like that out at the sand dunes, and I'm like, don't think, just go. The same way, I was looking at the beard, touching it, knowing that I'm spreading germs immediately to the <laughs> clippers, and it's gone, just like that. Yeah, I have a really bad habit of stroking my beard. If you're a, a viewer of the podcast, that you've probably seen a few of those sneak through. Oh, for sure. Uh, I don't know of any guy that has a luscious beard that doesn't like to stroke it, if you know what I mean. But yeah, sh- my beard was nowhere near as luscious as yours, and I couldn't keep my hands off of it, so it's time for a change. Yeah. It takes a lot of self-restraint, for sure, yeah. to uh, not touch your face these days. How, um, you, how you holding up over there? Uh, You know, I haven't slowed down any because of the nature of what I do, mm-hmm. so um, I'm doing a lot of consulting on the side and helping some businesses out here locally um, and then uh, just keeping busy with all this stuff, the podcast and the video creation, the content creation. Um, you know, it, it basically hasn't slowed down. If not, it's sped up for me and, and trying to utilize my hours better. And yeah, um, but it's tiring. You got a lot to do during the day and then you have a family to uh, keep in the loop and entertain and um, get the kids educated and, you know, take the dogs for walks and all that kind of stuff. So that's been a it's big been part a, of the of the last week. You know, uh, when the wife comes home, we immediately go to the table, get caught up on schoolwork. Uh, our school actually hasn't shut down. They're still doing a lot of stuff. Uh, my daughter's in constant communication with her teachers, and you know, they're, you know, there's. It's really interesting because nothing they. I was told that nothing they can do can improve their grade, but they can hurt their grade right now by not participating. So, I'm a. There may be an email that goes out to get a little more clarification <laughs> on that. <laughs> right. But I'm not opposed to them working by any stretch, but to have them get some benefit out of it, I think that would be really pro- uh, re- responsible, I think is the proper word. Yeah, there's definitely going to be some flexibility that has to be kind of across the board. I know that, uh, like with our kids' schooling, they uh, pretty much just said good luck and have a great summer. Right. Um, d- didn't do anything for us. And then out of the blue this last week, they came out with some curriculum and, and projects for the kids to get done. Uh, so uh, it depends on what grade they're in. If they're in the elementary school, like my uh, second child, um, they've actually got uh, online things that they're starting to work through now. Um, but for our my older kid, who is in the middle school range, he's uh, kind of left to you know, a whole bunch of web links and you know, things like that, that it's up to us to kind of push them through. Yeah. Um, and, uh, hopefully, you know, when we talk about next year and all that, uh, they've gotten everything figured out by then on their testing and, um, you know, grade allocation and things like that. Gotcha. So the, so the family has been holding in there and we actually, this last weekend, my dryer went out and just everything started breaking and falling apart, but you know, can't get discouraged. Just got to keep, plowing through and and getting things fixed and moving forward and um eventually uh things come together and and uh kind of surviving through it all um the craziest thing and the the meme that's going around is you know we can all congregate at walmart and get everything we need for for groceries and day-to-day life but we can't go out to the dunes and uh open out the uh the throttle for some reason that uh getting away from people doesn't make sense when they want us to social distance apparently yeah i i don't know really how to my take on that whole process is pretty simple it is whatever we can do to get this behind us and moving forward with normal everyday life you know and i know a lot of people have a lot of different opinions on it but as it sits right now as you probably saw yesterday our our governor instituted a uh another extension to where we're going to be sheltering in place until May 4th. It is right. currently, what's today, April 3rd, somewhere in there. And, uh, yeah, we got another month. Yeah. I mean, that's not, I mean, it's, it's really not the end of the world from an isolation standpoint, from a stay at home standpoint. I mean, it is literally 36 degrees outside and it's blowing about 40 miles an hour. So that's one yeah. of those situations where I'm really not missing that much. You know, I, it's not like I would be out riding right now. So, it's not yeah. it's not too big of a 
too big of a sacrifice. You know, if we were planning on on buying an upgrade, you know, this fall for the machine, uh, and we can afford to do so, maybe we buy that now instead of later. Um, and uh, whatever you can do to support your community locally, but also your community abroad for the off-road community. If you can buy something or uh, subscribe to something that would support a local business or a, com- a community of uh, off-roaders, uh, now would be the time to definitely reach out and do that if you're if you're able to. While well, also, res- you know, got to institute some sort of financial responsibility because you know there isn't a company and uh, there's a company probably in the world right now that this isn't causing them to totally reevaluate the majority of their processes especially from an expenditure sure. standpoint and uh i don't know if most people you know i've had a few conversations with this because even though we're in a global pandemic i am still getting requests for sponsorships still getting requests for free product and uh it's one of those things where um, it's, it caught me off guard a little bit. I was expecting everything to kind of slow down, especially that. But I can tell you right now, and I'm going to look in the camera and tell you that as it pertains to those boardrooms and as it pertains to those expenditures, the first place companies look to save money is sales and marketing. So definitely keep that yep. in mind when you're filling out those resumes. Marketing departments are always, um, like you said, first hit with cutbacks. Um, and unfortunately, uh to, well, there's two sides of that, right? Like nowadays, it's cheaper than ever to be online and be in front of people's eyes. Right. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, the people that have to deal with those interactions and those conversations um, usually get um, reined back a bit. And uh, you know, if you're if you're new to uh, reaching out to a brand uh, right now and you're looking for sponsorship or whatever, um, you know, obviously that you got the biggest uphill battle to fight than you ever had before. So, um, if you're, if you're going to break through, you're going to break through with the intention that you're going to hold on for a little bit. So, um, right. but, uh, that doesn't mean stop. I mean, there, there's still people on the other side looking at, at emails and applications, things like that, but you're going to have to definitely make a, a valid case for, uh, why you're uh, a value to the brand and, and, uh, you're going to need to make an extra effort to stand out from the rest of them. Well, combine that with you're just going to have to be patient because, I mean, as it sits right now, the majority of the races are actually canceled or postponed. So, I right. mean, I don't really think that we're going to get a glimpse of our prior reality <laughs> potentially till August, September, you know, unless there's some sort of major antiviral yeah. b- breakthrough that comes through. And it sounds like there's some good news to be had out there. But, you know, I'm definitely s- good news. Yeah, I'm definitely not one of the guys that is going to look at this from a political standpoint. It's just this this is what it is. I've got a. 70 year old or a 78 year old asthmatic father and a 74 year old mother who uh, who's dealing with some of her own things i won't go into that but uh, my job right now is to keep them healthy as well as selling tons upon tons of the best battery in america so <laughs> for sure so yeah. if you're looking for a great agm battery i know who you can uh, contact oh you said great i said the best let's get <laughs> let's get that clear i didn't mean to downplay the quality of yeah. your product and i'm sorry yeah. <laughs> But, uh, so yeah, I, you know, the other thing is too, is I, I'm, I'm really, really blessed. You know, I, as we've discussed prior, my car is not with me right now. It hasn't been with me for about a month. It's in the hands of a cage builder down in Hermiston, Oregon. And, uh, I can't wait to get my hands on it. I've gotten a few updates from him. It's just, that guy is so talented. So I'm really excited to see where he goes with it. But it is one of those things where, uh, from a blessed standpoint, you know, I live on a farm. You and I have filmed out here on this farm. And um, as long as you and I are healthy, I think that uh, we're going to make use of this space. You know, if if we're going into June and going into July and we're still in kind of a gray area, I think that you and I are going to you and I are going to have some fun out on this place, maybe even rent an excavator to build some obstacles, build some berms and stuff and really build our own little private playground. So I I think this needs to happen either way. No, it definitely does. I, I, I mean, I look at some of the natural features that are out there and we've got some places where we can really, really get on the gas and uh, open our cars up for some pretty major speed. But, you know, as we've done in the past, we've also got some rock crawling stuff out here that we can go have some fun with as well. Well, I don't want to make you too jealous. Uh, you mentioned not having access to your car right now, but if you look at your screen, uh, I've done some final upgrades to my Axial car. And it looks a lot like someone's uh, X3, if you know what I mean. It sure does. That would look really good in the backdrop of my uh, uh, podcast, my my camera right here, <laughs> but I uh, might have to make that happen. So, so. Uh, just for everybody that is struggling to find things to do at home, 
uh, if you have the ability to order one, if you don't already have one, Axial uh, makes a great RC car in the X3, uh, the Maverick X3 body shape. And I bought one for my son for his birthday this last December. And I bought a second one for me to participate and, and for the other kids to participate. And uh, I just took it all apart, painted it all uh, uh, matching blue to match your car and, and give you a little tease. Oh, that's awesome. But we were outside last night racing in the street with a ramp and everything else. We set up an a obstacle course and we're doing all sorts of racing and lapping and uh, there was no cars driving. So we had uh, plenty of space and we had a dirt jump and a, and a mountain and a hill climb and all sorts of stuff. I can't remember what I used to have. It was a, it was either a SC10 but or a Traxxas or something like that. It, it was a, uh, uh, it was a short course RC car and it was super fast. It's just like anything that I buy. I just get impulsive and I'll get it. And um, next thing you know, squirrel <laughs> and I'm on to the next thing. And uh, right. yeah, it, it was fun. I, I think I, if I remember right, I think I actually gave it to my brother-in-law. But uh, yeah, that'd probably be fun. And especially with uh, the cameras and stuff like that and all this gear and nothing to shoot might be fun to just beat on that. But the, the, the problem with that was that that project and that little toy was once I got done with it, I got bored with it. You know, the fun oh. part was building it. Like driving it and stuff was literally, <laughs> I was almost over it immediately. So in terms right. of what's keeping me busy, you know, I've, uh, I'm not going to lie, man. I, in the afternoons, once I get some work done, I am absolutely dominating on franchise mode in Madden right now. <laughs> just, I mean, yeah, right. yeah, I'm just killing it. So <laughs> the nice thing about these uh, modern cars is that if you spend enough money to get into um, a modifiable chassis, you can buy different wheels, tires, things like that. And the axial stuff, they even have like six by sixes and old like military trucks and off-road uh, like pre-runners, things like that. They even have like portal systems you can put on them. Oh, wow. So uh, yeah, it's a great hobby to get into with your kids and to really explore some creativity and just, you know, side channel uh, fun that you wouldn't normally have in a sport that you enjoy in the day to day. So you should take up some conversation with Ben. So, um, Quick disclaimer, I have a brother, Ben, and you have a brother, Ben, for those who don't <laughs> we both know. both have brothers, Ben. We both have brothers, Ben, and both have a little bit of an affiliation with the channel, with the show. And right. uh, uh, Ben's gone out on some rides with us. Ben is an RC guy, for sure. He's got, I mean, he does gas power, electric, short course. Uh, um, I'm not sure what the actual title is, but there's like this, uh, there's a series where guys race right. up in Spokane, and uh, and it's all done on carpet. Uh it's essentially yep, like a series. Yeah, yeah. And I think he has all that stuff. So he's been an enthusiast on that that stuff for quite a while. The carpet stuff's pretty cool, but the the stuff I really enjoy is the outdoors dirt track stuff that you That's can cool. really they can really get them flying pretty big and uh they're they're fast little suckers and oh, for sure. what's really interesting is uh you know, when you're out jumping your car uh, you know, you have to take into consideration throttle control and things like that to uh, not nosedive and, and all that kind of stuff and how much of an approach angle you're going to take and all that kind of stuff. And it's equally important in RC cars. And it's really funny is that some of these guys can can do full f flips in the air when they're doing it all based off of throttle control. So yeah. um, it's pretty cool stuff, uh, a hobby that is a little bit spendy to get into. But once you're in, it's all a matter of just what little parts and things you want to upgrade here and there. So uh, all, all I'll say is just be careful because much like UTV, once you get your hands on some of that stuff and you start playing with it, it can be a little bit of an obsession. And you just start next thing you know, your Amazon basket's full or your shopping <laughs> cart. At the, I mean, that, that was my problem. I haven't done anything with that in about five years. But while so I, was I figured doing, out, a, it was I figured out a trick for that is this uh, Amazon has this uh, thing called a buy now button. Yeah. So if you just buy now, it's never in your cart and you can never say your cart's full. I know. And then all of a sudden, four days later, something shows up that you forgot you bought. and uh, It's like Christmas every day. Right. Right. Just make sure you're hosing <laughs> all that stuff down and disinfecting it when it shows up. Yeah. Especially anything that's plastic. For sure. So uh, today's topic on the episode uh, is the Speed UTV. So Robbie Gordon uh, announced at last year's um, Sandsport show that he was going to come out with his own side-by-side uh, -side manufacturing. Um, and he was going to come out. He already owns the Speed side-by-side -side brand, and he makes a whole slew of upgrades for the Wildcat products and, and even some stuff for the other manufacturers. Um, but he decided that you know he was done uh, being the one told what to do and is going to be uh, coming out with his own brand. We've covered a little bit in past episodes about where we thought uh, maybe the brand was going or, or what they were going to come out with, but 
he had announced that Sandsport that they were going to come out with a 4x uh, side by side, and 4x being uh, a derivative of the double X Wildcat and things like that, where he had previously put a lot of time and energy and patents into at uh, Textron slash Arctic Cat. So uh, he came out uh, this last month with uh, a new series on the social media where he does kind of like a boardroom talk slideshow with the community and is starting to discuss and show off different parts of the manufacturing process on getting a new vehicle out to market. So uh, he, he's been doing these, these talks and now he's going to be doing them supposedly every Wednesday at 7 p.m. Eastern. Uh, so if you're interested in the Speed UTV development, uh, I encourage you to follow their Facebook and Instagrams. They're doing live videos every Wednesday about kind of the progression, decision making, uh, specs and things like that on the Speed UTV. And going into this, we were really kind of just guessing a lot of what was going to happen. There was a lot of uh, generalities uh, discussed at Spansport and uh, up to this point uh, about the vehicle they were going to be making. And so uh, I know you've looked at the specs that we got to go over today, Ian, a little bit, but uh, going into this, what was your perception of Speed UTV, Robbie Gordon's uh, project and kind of the car that was going to inevitably come out of this? So prior to yesterday or day before, whenever that press conference was, uh, it, I, I was a lot of question marks, obviously. I've got a little time in the Wildcat and I know he had a major, major part in the development of that car. Uh, since then, it's been all smiles. So, and here's what I love about it. Uh, the idea that I could get a machine that's over 300 horsepower, 77 inches wide, 15 gallon fuel tank. Like I, I know you're, I'm, I'm jumping the gun here and I know you're going to go over all these specs because like you're literally the most analytical guy in side by side that I know, but <laughs> I'm talking about the stuff that excites me. And I can tell you right now, like 15 gallons, 77 inches, 300 plus horsepower, Here's the thing that's weird, though. Like, I was looking on the website, and I didn't see where it said open differential, but on the actual press conference, he said open differential. Now, from a sand car standpoint, what, you know, that, that translates to me. Like, in my head, I'm thinking handbrake. And there's no shortage of guys on a Can-Am X3 that are using, making use of a handbrake, but with a with a, uh, a lock differential, you know, I mean, in, in a nutshell, you might be even doing more damage than than good then you'd be able to actually utilize that but i love the idea of taking a high horsepower machine in there and getting the rear end to come around on you with a brake or something of that nature and then just exploding out of a corner if that's something we can do in this car my wife is going to hate me when she sees two machines in my freaking garage i'm not even kidding yeah i i i'm pumped i am really pumped you know if there's one thing i can tell you about the time i spent in the 2x and mind you there could be some similarities with the 2X, but by and large, this is all its own deal. It's a standalone machine, but the 2X had some characteristics in it that I really liked when I wrote it, when I drove it. And if, if it, if that DNA is somewhat, uh, still in this machine, dialed in, ramped up and upgraded, I think he, I, I'm really interested. I'm really interested. I really hope, I, I hope this, you know, cause he, his motivation was to really change things and shake things up about what's possible in this industry with the OEs. And if what is being said is going to happen, it's going to do that. It's going to be one heck of a machine to contend with. Yeah. And I kind of went into this with the understanding that, or I should say, I went into this with the perception that this was really uh, more of a racing uh, gimmick for Gordon's race team um, that he was building this brand to really just come up with a, a vehicle that has enough sales to then justify him using the car he wants to build off of in the race series. Uh, a lot of automa automotive manufacturers will do this throughout the years, right? They'll come out with a, a super limited edition version of a car just so that it can race in the series with that car. Right. And it's usually got a high price tag. It's usually got a real uh, high collectib uh, collectability to it. Um, things like that. We see that with Ford and Chevy and uh, Audi and all those guys. Uh, in the UTV world, that really hasn't been a thing. Um, the race series uh, have been really kind of delegated by the major OEs in the first place. They have a big part on setting what the races are going to be, um, especially if they're the bigger series out in the desert. And, uh, you know, I think this was Robbie Gordon coming out of the truck world saying, you know, we've, we've done almost everything here. We want to really dominate the UTV space. And uh, to do that, I think we need a new platform. And I, I think that's where my perception of his uh, investment of 
all this is going is just to build that that ability for them to race at a higher level. Now, that being said, I'm sure there is a component of his understanding and his team's understanding that they're trying to also one up everybody and become the leading power and uh, platform in the UTV industry. I think they want to kind of just have that feather in their cap and be able to taunt that in front of all the people that Robbie Gordon's worked with in the past that have, in his opinion, screwed him over. So, you um, know, and if this, if this is a, um, a thing for, you know, it's kind of a, like a pet project where it's, you know, he's using it for the development of his racing team and we the consumer benefit from it i'm mad props man i mean i've I've been on the record since day one that racing you know i'm an overlander man i like to go up into the mountains but racing is what develops technology you know innovation is coming from innovation in utv comes from racing and if i can take the the uh basically like something that's uh, qualified to be in the road warrior mad max up into the mountains i know i'm well positioned to kick some butt you know i i like i like going into those situations i like going into those gnarly situations up in the mountains with what i think is the best the most adequate vehicle to take on that type of terrain and uh you know if if what happen if what's going to happen what i think's going to happen i mean he is going to push the other oes forward and uh i'm all for it man i'm i'm pumped to see where this goes well, our whole industry has been based out of racing, right? Like yeah. the whole sport UTV didn't exist until the racers of the off-road racing scene took, you know, the old rhinos and the old uh, uh, pioneers and things like that and started pushing them to their limits and jumping them and doing funny things with them uh, that you wouldn't normally do with a utility vehicle. And that's where, you know, the UTV and the SSV n- names came from is that you know, they're, they're pushing these things to the extreme. So, um, you know, shock development, chassis development, angle development, all that kind of stuff came from the racers in the racing and, and the guys that went to the OEs and, and developed these programs to build uh, these kind of cars. And uh, like you said, if Gordon can benefit this in his race team, and then as a side result of that, we the community benefit out of that, there is no there is no reason to hold that back in my opinion. Yeah. So I'm going to put you on the spot. Like I did a few weeks back. Um, I asked you one to 10, how excited you were about the segue. And if I remember right, you said eight and I asked you about how excited you were about this, about speed. If I remember right, you said about a five, where are you at now? You know, uh, honestly, I'm kind of on the fence at the moment because at the same time that a lot of this is looking like it's actually going to happen, it still hasn't happened yet. So um, there are a lot of pre-orders. There's a lot of potential to still uh, drop the ball. And, um, you know, I still don't they're, – they're putting a lot of really uh, aggressive timelines on this. And not only that, he's also announced, um, you know – they, they originally announced they're going to have a four-seater and a two-seater later on, uh, but he's also now um, announced that they're going to have an a, a enclosed cab version with HVAC, uh, with door seals and all that stuff, so you have more of a truck scenario. So I got uh, a comment on that. Go ahead. Go ahead. And then also they're going to come out with a, what they're calling a UTT version, which is more of a trophy truck-inspired version of it, which is the same chassis, same shocks, and all that kind of stuff. But... Um, that it'll be more of a, a longer single row cab, so two door, and then a longer bed, uh, more like a truck. So uh, the announcement of an, an actual four version variant of a vehicle um, is really ambitious. And uh, I mean, I, I don't know everybody in the industry, but if anybody in the industry could do it, it'd probably be Gordon. But, um, you know, coming out of the gate with four chassis in development and trying to get them out before the or at least one of these chassis out before the end of the year um, is, a, is a tall order for any manufacturer, especially one that has already all the manufacturing in place, let alone somebody that doesn't and has to develop it. So, um, you know, I'm really curious. I have a stoke level of, of still that mid range on the actual product coming out to the anticipation that the community has put it to. But I have more excitement in the idea that um, they're looking long term. They're looking to really develop a program. And so my opinion of where uh, they were in public perception has changed a bit. And I think the guys that all got their um, their down payments on their cars to reserve their car numbers, um, I think they're all going to really benefit out of this because I think it's going to be twice as much uh, 
retail uh, than it would be uh, in this pre-launch. So all these guys that have bought a $32,000 machine, I think that in the long run, you know, once this all this whole program goes through its complete life cycle, that guys are going to end up having to pay 50 grand for these things. It could be. Yeah. I was perplexed by the whole HVAC thing, you know, really. Uh, what he's trying to design is an out-of-the-box race vehicle that you could go on and take on. You could take on uh, short course, desert racing, the whole ball of wax. So it's it's a really aggressive platform in UTV. And, I would, you know, when we were on that, somebody had actually asked about that HVAC version. I'm like, dude, buy a Toyota. Buy a Jeep. I mean, I know I'm going to alienate some people by saying that, and I, I apologize, but, you know, I, I just kind of figured that something like HVAC would be, it wouldn't really be on his radar. So I was really surprised that they're talking about building a, an entirely closed cab. I mean, I, I know guys up in uh, Yellowknife, uh, uh, Anchorage, Fairbanks, I know they all want to go out and ride stuff uh, as well, but, like, I just what's the market for that? You know? And I mean, I know Polaris builds a Ranger that, uh, the North star edition that has all that sort yep. of stuff. And it's just, it's one of those things. Like I was actually really surprised that's on their radar, you know? And, and, and if I were going to go down that path, if I wanted a machine that was going to provide me with that, I mean, I'm, I'm buying a Tacoma TRD pro or I'm buying a Jeep or, or something like that. I just, U UTV, UTV has a specific purpose for me off road, you know, the off road version of it. And if I was going to go down that road, that's telling you that I'm 100% interested in building a, a dedicated overland type vehicle. I'm going to build it off of a, of a vehicle, a car chassis, you know, like, like a Toyota or a Jeep. Yeah, there's definitely, and you know, up to this point, we also don't have any of the pricing on these variants, things like that. So uh, having a fully enclosed cab version, you know, might push the, the price up another 10 grand. We don't sure. know. Sure. Um, and so when you're talking, uh, let, let's just hypothetically say that uh, the retail stays at that 32 to 35 range. Um, if you add another uh, eight to 10 grand on top of that, right, you're talking about 45 grand um, right off the top of your head you can think of like four or five trucks or cars that you can buy for 45 grand that would do a whole lot more than an off-road vehicle in your day-to-day -day life as a consumer. Sure. So uh, when you're talking about, you know, adding HVAC and, and wanting to build just an overland vehicle at that point, um, I think it really comes down to uh, the guy that um, is either going to have plenty of money that he's not even questioning what it costs, or you're talking and he's just going to be going off-roading and wants to have all the bells and whistles. Or you're going to be talking about the guy that uh, lives in a climate uh, to where um, they're frequently having to bundle up and cover up and things like that. So if guys that are up in the northern territories or have a lot of monsoon type weather throughout the year, uh, they're going to want an enclosed cab vehicle that can go off road and handle all these things. Because honestly, even if you built a fully capable uh, overland Toyota or, um, you know, even if you had a Raptor, uh, they're still limited to the fact that they have, um, a lot of steel to move around. Yeah. And so yeah. I, I need you to clarify something moving forward though. What you said, even if you have a Raptor, a Raptor, I want you to change that to when you have a Raptor because uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, that's on the bucket list, man. That's on the bucket no, list for sure. No, no Corvettes for me, man. I, I would take a Raptor right now. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, let's make a deal. You buy the Raptor, and I'll buy the Corvette C8, and then we can just hand off whenever we get the, the inkling to, to drive one of them. The wife and I were actually talking about our next vehicle a while back, and, and I, I, was, I had a conversation with uh, Greg Cottrell, uh, who owns Rugged Radio, and he and, he and I were talking about, uh, about a Raptor deal, and I was explaining it, play, giving my wife the play-by-play, -play. and what Greg said, he was saying that he met this particular person in the industry at the Raptor run. And I went blank right there. Like literally the first thing that popped into my head was what Raptor run, you know, <laughs> like, I, I got super excited. I told my wife about that. And she, I, I don't think I've heard her laugh that hard in, in, in months, man. But uh, yeah, that is such a cool truck. I would just, Oh, the things I would do for something like that. It, you know, a couple of years with some good fortune. We'll see. So hopefully uh, the, re the, the economy rebounds and we can uh, start uh, investing some things that can return and reward us with a, with a Raptor, huh? Yeah, yeah. That, it'd be a Raptor, it'd be an AEV Ram. If you haven't seen the AEV, have you ever seen an AEV Ram? 
I, I have, yes. Oh, boy. <laughs> Those, <laughs> Those are pretty sick. Are, oh, my gosh. I mean. Now, I haven't seen them on the new the new body styling that they came out with. Um, I would assume it wouldn't look as good, but the older style oh, that um, probably you. looks, you know, oh. it's it's pretty hard to argue with it. <laughs> it. It looks so good. It's ridiculous on the new body style. Not even kidding. And, and you know, it's funny. They can do it with the half ton and they can do it with the Cummins as well. So just whatever platform you wanted to go off of, they can pull it off. And, yeah, that's slick. Yeah, the... Uh, Oh, I think it was the Diesel Brothers that did a like a, a Raptor F three fifty or something like that. That was pretty hot too. I, oh, yeah. I wouldn't mind one of those beasts either for yeah, a tow rig. I, yeah, I get as excited about trucks as I do about a UTV. So, <laughs> well, let's jump into this uh, speed UTV. So, uh, the last week and this week, uh, Robbie Gordon had a couple of these online streams and and divulged a bunch of details for us. Uh, and uh, so. They, re- they announced that they're going to have these four different models, but we're going to focus on the 4X model because that's the one they're pushing out first. Uh, and so all these details, unless I specify otherwise, are going to be in relation to the 4X uh, that is supposedly going to start delivering at the end of the year and beginning of next year. So um, I again, I'll, I'll preface with the fact that I don't believe that we're going to see these at the end of the year. I think we're going to see these early next year. Um, or there might be some demo units that are delivered just to get the, the wheels turning uh, that maybe don't have all the bells and whistles on them uh, at launch. But um, let's start with the uh, dimensions of the vehicle. You know, and like the other thing, said, real quickly to clarify as well, he did preface by saying that there was going to be a lot more information available and a lot of stuff that's going to get released at the sand show. You know, so that that's oh, worth okay. noting. But, the, you know, I, I'm not trying to jump to conclusions or anything like that. Uh, let's just Let's just hope that there is a sand show let's just hope there is a SEMA at this point so yeah there's definitely been a lot of changing on how companies are divulging product launches and things like that so um it it definitely could look different uh next year yeah hopefully not so like you said uh there's going to be a 15 gallon fuel tank now he's kind of been on different uh points of accuracy with some of these details so uh he had initially had said over 15 gallons then he said around 15 gallons and i believe the website right now says around 15 gallons so we can't really use it as a definitive number but like you had said 15 gallons almost doubles uh or i'm sorry about is in about a 15 percent increase over your standard uh, fuel tank in a side-by-side so if you figure you can go 100 to 130 miles in a side-by-side depending on your riding style and where you're at uh, an additional 50 percent on your gas tank is huge and uh when you look at the actual design of what they've kind of cad designed up for us uh us the community uh they're showing that as a single-sided fuel cell so um they haven't shown anything on the driver's side in that same position in that rear position uh so i don't know what's going there uh maybe there's going to be a racing upgrade to the fuel cell to be double the capacity maybe a 30 gallon or a 40 gallon uh but that fuel cell is only on the passenger side so if there's nothing on the driver's side to hinder the installation of a second tank or maybe a larger tank you could potentially see this vehicle coming out with a 30 40 uh, gallon option for racing Possibly, yeah. I'm excited about it. You know, uh, you jumped into the, uh, you were talking about the four-seater, and that's, you know, my next car may very well be a four-seater. And from, from the look of the what he, what he's promoting here, I, I'm, I'm kind of excited about it, man. I, I just, you know, he, he went into a lot of wheel-based uh, dimension type stuff. And the four-seaters don't really get my blood boiling. Like the Turbo S four-seater is the only one that really kind of strikes a chord with me. I love that car. As a matter of fact, if, if I was buying a new machine tomorrow, it would be that car. Um, he's got me kind of scratching my head as to whether or not uh, I might go that route next time. So, so to continue on, uh, they're going to be pushing this out with a 120 wheel inch, uh, 20 inch wheelbase, uh, which is actually um, a really nice uh, wheelbase. Uh, I don't know about a, so if you look at the, the Canon Max, right, they're at like 130 inches or so. Yeah, um, which and is then the same look, as a Chevy Suburban, by the way. <laughs> that's right yeah um and uh the polaris uh the xp non-pro i think was around 113 inches something like that uh so um the the 120 wheel inch wheelbase uh supposedly is that same uh perfect wheelbase that he uses for his trophy trucks um 
And so it'd be interesting to see um, how that compares to the other cars. Now, uh, that being said, the suspension's all different and everything else as well. So uh, it's not an apples to apples comparison. It'll be more like an apples to oranges, but um, it'll be super interesting to see how that 120 inch wheelbase works out for a four seater. Um, and then it comes out with 15 inches of ground clearance. Uh, which is, you know, more than anybody else. Everybody else peaks at 14. I think the Can-Am XDS peaks at 14 inches of ground clearance. So uh, when you're talking about a four-seat car where you have 120-inch wheelbase, ground clearance is really crucial when you're trying to clear over the top of lips um, or over rocks, things like that, and having 15 inches of the ground clearance will be a huge uh, win for them. For sure. Um, now, something that you were interested in is this, the fact that they're launching at 77 inches. Uh, wide. Uh, and he's been really clear to specify that that, that wheel bulge. So um, I'm not sure what the uh, what the width will be at the wheels, probably about uh, 74, um, which I think the who's at 74? Somebody's at 74. Anyways, um, the the width at 77 at the tire uh, is actually going to be the widest in the industry but it's going to be also the widest that's race legal in all the series right so they're pushing the boundaries on how far out they can get that wheelbase uh and then also uh how wide they can be and how planted they can be on the ground now they've also said they're going to put out a 72 inch model in the future so if you take in the fact that they're going to be putting out four cars they're also going to be putting out four width or uh, four cars with two widths so really interesting to see what they're doing there fyi for me wider is better I know a lot. I know there's certain restrictions and stuff like that at different parts of the country, but we live out west, and I mean, 77 inches just there isn't anywhere I'm going to get shut down out of riding out there. And if it if it means I can go faster, if it means I can dive into corners harder, if it means it's going to absorb whoops better, yeah, I'm all in. I think this really comes down to uh, turning radius. If you look at how wide that machine is, um, you know, and the, the the degree of which those tires will have to turn. Uh, to get you a nice sharp corner, that's going to be really where it's going to um, separate people uh, on the width of the machine. So if you're in the race scene, you know, you're not taking super sharp hairpins uh, up in the mountains, right? You're taking long swoopy turns or uh, navigational uh, steering obstacles, but you're not really having to do hairpins. Uh, whereas if you're a consumer, a lot of times you are doing hairpins. You're doing uh, trails up and down the mountains or into valleys where you're actually having to go back and forth or around trees, things like that. And I can see a lot of people arguing against the 72, uh, 77 inch wide uh, chassis to to basically say that they they can't do what they want to just because it's too wide or it doesn't sharp doesn't turn sharp enough just like you would do comparing comparing a yxz on a short course race versus um you know maybe a full-size can-am or polaris they're always going to outsteer the bigger competitors because of that sharp turning radius and if at 77 inches they don't have a sharp turning radius um they're not going to win at the short course right and so if we look at the uh, wheel bases uh for these for these vehicles, like we said, 120 inch wheelbase for the four door, the four X. Uh, but they also have four different cars, right? So they're going to have, um, a two seater, uh, version at 95 inches and, uh, they're going to have a UTT variant that is at 110 inches. So they're going to take the four, the four seating chassis. They're going to shorten that back seat, um, 10 inches and then wall it off. So it's just storage behind the seat. Um, and Gordon had also said that that, that space is going to be fully usable for, uh, uh, seat travel. So if you are an ex uh, a very large or tall individual, you'll have that extra space, uh, to push the seat back as well, uh, or store stuff. So if you're talking about overlanding, you know, we talked a little bit about maybe that vehicle being a better solution for overlanding. If you had, if you don't have the need to have four seats, four people in the vehicle, um, and you can get away with a two seat, uh, vehicle, the UTT would be an amazing overland vehicle simply because of the storage and the extended, uh, trunk that we'll talk about. Um, having 10 inches behind the seats, huge. Absolutely. Absolutely. An inter interesting fact is that, um, with the chassis, uh, Gordon's team is going to make uh, the front end of the car, basically from the seats forward, the front seats forward, 100% um, identical across all these vehicles. So um, if you could think from a manufacturing side, they have to make one front end, basically one half of the car is done on all these vehicles. And then you have various lengths and options for the rear end of the car. And so uh, it's really interesting to me how they're approaching that. Um, the, the chassis is supposed to be all one piece, all MIG welded uh, with uh, quarter, uh, one and three quarter inch on the main chassis. 
which is what we expect for rollover cage and all that stuff, um, at 095 walled uh, DOM equivalent tubing. So I don't know what equivalent means, uh, but that's what they've put down. So I think they have maybe a deal on um, a, a tube supplier uh, that is just basically qualifying the, the steel at the same rating. Um, and uh, the variation on thickness goes from 095 to 120 uh, throughout the chassis and then different variations on outer diameter depending on the structural uh, requirement of that tubing. Um, but all, all MIG welded. Uh, they're not going to take the time and investment on TIG, uh, which a lot of people were kind of um, upset with the fact that they were going to get this high class vehicle uh, without a TIG weld. Um, honestly, 99% of the industry, automotive industry, you know, all these places that you buy vehicles all use MIG weld. It's not unheard it's of cheaper. to go that route. It's a lot cheaper. It's fairly easy to dial in and keep reliable. The The consistency factor is high. Uh, TIG welding is very operator specific. And so when you're talking about distributing a, a vehicle to a mass audience, um, TIG welding really isn't the solution uh, when you're talking about consistency. As far as oddities in the chassis, there's really nothing crazy or out of place, but what is really interesting is that they're box reinforcing a lot of the different um, structural components. So um, there is a uh, shock mount, or, or I should say where the shocks mount to the chassis, uh, for instance, in the rear of the vehicle. Uh, normally you would just tie into the, the, the cage, um, which would be a round tube with a bracket, and then that bracket attaches to the shock. But what they're doing is they're actually box framing uh, the entire section to where the shock and suspension mounts, uh, was just, which is going to make this vehicle super rigid. Um, I, th I would be willing to say right out of the gun that when this vehicle comes out, it's going to be the r most rigid vehicle that the UTV industry has ever seen, um, even even compared to like custom-built chassis. And then when you talk about uh, differentials in how they're doing their chassis versus everybody else, they're going to also come out with a forged um bulkhead in the front of the vehicle so uh, the front smart. differential and the suspension and all the components of the front end are going to tie to one single forged piece uh, which will house the front diff so uh, that is unheard of in our industry uh, that's something that you only see in the um, like formula race cars and and the high-end trophy trucks things like that um, what do you think ian about tying everything in the front to a single forged piece I think it's smart. I think it should be standardized on certain cars, like the actual pure sport cars. I mean, I know that's such a weak point on my car, on the Can-Am. You know, if you talk to anybody, it's one of the first things. It's not one of the first things that people upgrade. Usually people upgrade it once it's failed. So I, I, I think it's a smart move. Yeah. So if you think about it, <clears throat> this entire car is going to be double sheared uh, bearing joints. So there's going to be no... Uh, ball mounts to fail. There's going to be no um, other various different types of uh, hinging or single shear uh, sway bars, things like that, that are, are known to fail. This car is 100% ball jointless, uh, except for the uni balls that are in the um, the actual A arms and trailing arms. So this whole car, even even the wheels uh, mount to a spindle uh, instead of just a um, A arm ball jointed uh, hub. So uh, that's really interesting. That's something that I think uh, the entire industry should take note of because we are at such a point of usability on these machines that um, a ball joint on a front A-arm made sense when you only had 90 horsepower and eight inches of, of, of suspension travel and basically we're just driving the mountains. Um, nowadays, we have the majority of the industry pushing their cars to the max and and going to the dunes, doing jumping, doing mudding, doing, you know, all sorts of crazy things that didn't exist in the in the prior version of the of the industry. So getting away from ball joints, I think, is a huge win for speed UTV and something that all the industry guys going to a spindle front end is going to be, you know, where the next progression is going to be at. I mean, if you if you were to take um, like your previous YXZ and put it into a spindle suspension setup, um, I don't think there would have been an argument for how amazing that whole thing would have operated. So, Very likely. You know, anything you can do to prep these things prior to uh, customers taking delivery for high horsepower, um, I would probably say, you know, horsepower has 
really kind of evolved over the last, I'd say even as recent as like six to eight months. It's just unbelievable the power that these guys are getting out of these cars. Even the newest of riders, one of the first questions they ask on these threads is how to get more power out of their X3, which is already a rocket. So, I mean, you know, toughening these things up, making them safer, making them more reliable at an OE level, it's pretty apparent that in the UTV industry, people will pay for that. So I know for that, sure. uh, yeah, and I know that uh, the price... Still to this day, people complain about the price of these machines. Some people, you know, and you'll see that on some of the Can-Am pages, especially the Can-Am pages that people will complain about a $28,000 machine. I mean, you know, suspension on a 4400G per suspension on a Class 1 is somewhere around 20 to 25 retail. So, I mean, there's a reason that these things cost a lot of money. The horsepower and the and the cost of horsepower um, and the suspension that's required to handle the horsepower is definitely something that is an evolving number, and that ratio seems to get further and further from customers' expectations. Uh, and I think that's a big part of just communication and education. I don't think the consumer gets educated by these OEs as, as well as they should be. Right. The back or the yeah the rear of the chassis uh, is being made to allow. The removal of the back frame so that the entire engine and transmission setup can be extracted from the vehicle all in one piece without having to tear the entire vehicle down, which I think is a huge uh, win for racers. Um, every single racer that I know um, basically is going to be championing that fact that they can pull the engine out, work on everything on a, on a stand, and then put it all back into the car. Just for clarification, though, the, the, those are the type of features that I think really only he's going to be able to get away with, you know, from a uh, from a thought process standpoint. I mean, I'm telling you right now, I've been in procurement meetings with these OEs with, you know, I'm not going to name which OE, but I've literally heard procurement guys in the electrical um, in the electrical departments of these OEs say, quote unquote, as it relates to the accountants for these OEs, they will spend four months on a particular model to save a buck, one buck in production costs. That's one thing that uh, that I think Robbie has a tremendous advantage over these people is he can put those thoughts into it, and it's not going to weigh on those decisions as much as it would these other major OEs. So that's why I'm really hoping that this thing is a slam dunk and that it's, it's a winner because it's it's really going to cause people to have to catch up. Yeah, the, the idea that... Um you have a full manufacturing process to take into account when designing a new vehicle. Uh, it's something that Gordon's team doesn't have to to realize, right? Yeah. So they they are winning just from the fact that they're starting fresh. And um, you know, once once they get into full production, and if they continue this whole uh, vehicle development program t- into its maturity, um, they're going to then start realizing those manufacturing limitations. But um, when you're a small business and when you're doing small numbers and batches, uh, that stuff doesn't really come into play. You're basically given a clean slate to um, really start start fresh. And one of the things that um, I think will be under um, under communicated on this is the fact that they're using common parts on all their corners. So what that means is um, your upper A arms are going to be cross compatible, so you can flip them to either side, and you only have to carry one spare. The lower A arms are going to be boxed and symmetrical. The trailing arms are symmetrical. You can swap them in and out. You only need one spare. Uh, the axles, all four axles are going to be the same. You only need one spare axle. Um, you know, when you're talking about racing or even just um, long adventures where you're out deep and you need all your spares on the car, when you don't need to have one of each of everything or multiples right. of each of everything, that's a huge win. When you're going running out uh, in groups and you have all the same car, and one guy can bring a hub, one guy can bring an axle, one guy can bring a, an A arm, things yep. like that. Yep. That's a huge win. Yeah, it's just an example of what I was just saying about you know why why doesn't every pure sport machine have boxed A arms? It's money, you know, it's money, and and he yep. he's able to do stuff like that. And I think in the long run, two years, five years from now, I think we're all going to benefit from this. Yeah, for sure. I mean, pe- the the big OEs aren't going to push forward progression on on things like symmetrical trailing arms right they're they're going to uh do what's the most economical what 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 accomplishes the goal for the least amount of money um and uh because that's all their margin right so this this whole process isn't cheap either like there's nothing wrong with them trying to make more margin because it's very expensive to do all this no question and at the same time you have to make more money on top of that just simply to support the entire program so the fact that uh they're they're able to start fresh they can win in these areas 
uh, where the bigger OEs can't. And it's going to push the OEs to, to, to make some of those changes. And there might be a level of quality that Gordon's putting into, like, let's just say the lower A arm, right? It, there's going to be a certain level of thickness and material and welding and design that goes into that, that uh, the bigger OEs can't do at the moment, but they're going to figure out a way to compete at that level. And they're going to figure out a way to uh, do it for, at the economics that they need to operate at. And all that, all that does is it makes it easier for us to get that performance level at the price point that we needed to be at. Right, right. You know, and if from a learning standpoint, if I mean, obviously the uh, the OEs, the major OEs, know this, but if they didn't know it before, you know, when the Polaris Turbo S four seater came out, it, its initial MSRP was thirty two thousand. The uh, my car, the Can Am X3 RC, uh, RC, its initial MSRP was twenty eight five. So if they didn't know there was a market for a thirty thousand dollars side by side, boy, do they now. So I mean, as it yep. sits, if I could get if I could get a lot of the features that's on Robbie's car for thirty five thousand to forty thousand dollars, seventy seven inches wide, just something that I could take to the dunes right now that costs one third of a custom a custom long travel sand rail. And I could get, obviously, you're not going to get the same performance. Those things run anywhere from, you know, 580 up to 800. Up, I mean, extreme performance cars are up to 1,600 horsepower. Um, obviously, it's not going to perform like that, but it's also 25%, 33% of the money of one of those custom builds. So, and, and, you know, if I could jump into something like that for $35,000, even upwards of like $38,000, it would be in my garage. No question about it. And there's t there's there's tons of people just like me that would pay that kind of money for something that would perform that well. Yeah, there there used to be days where uh, that people, individuals and families would have, you know, the night a truck and a car. And I think these days people have figured out that life is a lot better when you have a truck and a side by side or a, a truck and a and a trailer full of toys, right? And so um, I think there's definitely is a market for 35 to 40 grand. Um, I don't think it's as big as the, uh, 18 to 2,400 or 2018 to $24,000 vehicles, but there is a market. And when there is a market, um, it's the first to economically make something that satisfy, that checks all the boxes. They're going to be the ones that win. But the, um, and the other thing is, is like with Yamaha and Polaris, you can step into an XPT right now. You can get a base model X3, 120 horsepower, anywhere from 15 to $17,000. You can get a YXZ for 13 to seventeen thousand dollars you're going to get an xpt in that price range too somewhere between 15 to 18 there is something for everybody if you want the absolute best of the best and you and you've got the ability to make those you know to buy one of those uh just elite performance machines like i said there's something for everybody and you and i both know that we could take an xpt and over the course of a base model xpt and over the course of three to four years build it into something that's an absolute juggernaut so if you want to get into something there's something for you even Kawasaki, uh, you know, is coming into the market with a brand new machine, uh, something that they've yet they haven't really had before. They've had mules and things like that, but they haven't had an actual pure sport machine. Um, even in there, even they're realizing that you know there's a price point for everybody, and their machine didn't really hit the price point at launch, and so you can get those at fifteen grand now. Yeah, um, yeah. And so uh, they're, I think that's they're, steel, by the way. <laughs> I, I think that's a great option. Yeah. Um, and they've been really responsive with all their kind of, um, you know, first attempt quirks and issues. And so they're really taking care of their customers, which is what they're known for. And um, like you said, they're realizing there's a price point for everybody and the product they were putting out was at a different price point. So they've adjusted. Right. So uh, with Gordon stuff. Launching at thirty two grand, I think, was them just spitballing what these things are going to cost and what it would require to get it uh, a process moving forward. Um, right. I don't, I don't foresee them staying at that price point. And like you said, I think they would be more at the forty grand range, um, or or up to fifty on the high horsepower units, or, or whatever that works out to be. So, um, yeah, there's a there's a price point for everybody. I think there is a market at that thirty five to forty. Um, it's just not as big. Yeah, if I can climb up a hill do a downturn and come out of it in a wheelie i'll pay 50 grand for that <laughs> right now so yep and it, and it costs a lot more to make that on your own right so if you can buy it um already made and get the cost savings of a manufacturing process you know that's a no-brainer right um so continuing down uh suspension um we talked about how all the 
uh, suspension travel parts will be uh, symmetrical. That even includes the um, control arms on the steering rack. Uh, the steering rack will be um, a electro-hydraulically assisted steering rack and really, really beefy uh, to a point where um, it's really going to be able to take all the abuse and destruction that people do out in the desert racing. I don't think anyone's going to have to upgrade that steering rack. And it's going to have, uh, I think it's over four points of connection to the frame. So it, it ain't going anywhere. And as long as the, uh, the, the rack and pinions are all made up to spec to com compete with that structure, uh, you're never going to have to replace that or manage that unit. Theoretically. Um, theoretically. theoretically. Someone will yeah. find it. Someone, someone will find the weakness. Someone absolutely will. Probably a newer guy too. Yeah, and, and they've um, touted less than 1% bump steer, even at full droop. So uh, it would be really interesting to see how that ra steering rack uh, makes its way to to market and what it looks like. Um, continuing down, uh, there's no radius rods because of the, uh, the Y setup on the trailing arm that uh, Robbie Gordon has patented. Um, there are uh, the, the front shocks are mounted to the lower A arm, which is where they should be. Um, and being boxed and, uh, and all that, you're never going to have a problem with uh, the shocks and the A arms uh, coming apart. They're never going to separate unless you um, uh, huck it off of a cliff. And you know, the, with that rear suspension, the jury will be out as to whether radius rods and stuff like that are actually necessary. That's one of the things that kind of has me a little bit of a, a head scratching you know, to see if it exposes a potential problem. I mean, the more power, the more problems you potentially run into, but we'll see. He knows what he's doing. He knows what he's doing. I mean, that's basically what they, uh, in, in generality, that's what they do with the trophy trucks, right? Um, the biggest win on that design is the dual uh, double shear mounting to the frame. So uh, with all of your current uh, OE models, uh, they all have a single ball joint at the or a uni joint at the uh, frame and then because of that you have to have trailing arms um, that design just requires trailing arms in in physics right uh, and then the trailing arms or i'm sorry the radius rods then have the ability to be either dual or triple like the can ams <clears throat> and depending on where you place them it could create different issues with um, how that suspension travels and, and the angles that you get out of that at full droop and at full compression um, being a uh, double shear like that or a, a double uh, double tab double shear setup uh, basically there's only one one direction for that suspension to go and that's up and down uh, it's never going to go left and right it's never going to it's never going to twist um, you don't have any of those problems and so uh, once you bring the vertical mounting into it via the shock uh, the only thing left to do is connect the axle and so that's why you see that on the on the wildcat which robbie gordon designed and that's why you see that on their trophy trucks and that's also why uh, he's going with it on this machine is that uh, it really alleviates a lot of problems, but it requires a more, much more expensive trailing arm. Um, and it adds more weight. It adds a lot more weight, actually. Um, you figure your uh, trailing arms are anywhere in the neighborhood of 15 to 25 pounds or more. Um, you can basically double that uh, for, for his trailing arms. Yeah. Yeah, when you look at what that car tips the scale at, too, it's kind of a reflection of uh, the components that are on it. Yeah, and he, he hasn't really nailed down a total vehicle weight, and I think that's basically because they don't have a total vehicle weight yet. Well, well he's at um, 1,900, and that might, be, that might be a little conservative. I think it's conservative. He's already yeah. said that he's going to be a few hundred or more pounds than anybody else. So Yeah, uh, for sure. Which, the, Cowie, the Cowie tips the scales right around that, and... You know, these two. Right. Are so the Kawasaki's the at 19 ballpark. and a half. The Polaris Pro four seater is at, you know, roughly 1920, I think. Um, Can Am's in that range as well. So everybody's just under that 2000 number. People don't really like to break that number. Um, and uh, I think they're going to be the first OE to really kind of um, not care about that uh, ceiling and just blow past it. Something super interesting on this is that uh, they're going with a very shallow shock angle on the front end. Uh, on the rear, um, it's pretty standard that shocks are just almost vertical because uh, you don't really right. have a lot of swing in your rear travel. Um, they did say that, 
<laughs> uh, but they did they did announce that you know the the shocks are going to be mounted lower in the chassis than any other car um, and that's because they're going to put all of the compression and all the travel below the chassis instead of allowing it to come up on into the chassis um, that's something that we first saw with the pro xp um, basically shock travel and all that stops once the car bottoms out you got about an inch left of travel before you actually hit the dirt um, so they said that they're going to mount those shocks lower in the car. Um, but you know, we'll see how that interprets into like body roll and things like that. Uh, but what, what's really interesting is that the front end is almost identically vertical to the rear. So, um, on a, on a, on a Polaris, your, your shock angle is steep enough to you, to where you notice it. And on the can amps, it's very steep. It goes almost all the way to the middle of the chassis. Um, and, and a lot of people like that for various different scenarios, especially dune travel. Um, but guys that do a lot of um, trail riding, a lot of um, uh, bumpy uh, stuff off road that isn't uh, related to uh, ma massive whoops and um, carving in the dunes, uh, they prefer more of a steep. Uh, 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 a more conservative upright angle. Uh, it does make the riding experience a little bit more bumpy. Um, but when you're in a off-road racing scenario, if you're doing desert racing, um, the, the biggest thing you're concerned about, about is the shock angle at full compression. That's, that's what you're worried about. You're not worried about, um, you know, full droop or, or standing still in a static spot. You're more worried about what this, what the, the shock angle is at full compression. And when you look at the designs of the speed UTV, uh, mock-ups that they've done, the shock angle at full compression is almost full 90 degrees to the shock to the suspension. So, um, the reason they do that is to maximize the shock travel, right? You're not going to lose, um, travel based off of the angle that you're at. If you're at a steep angle, like a Can-Am, your shock angle <clears throat> will utilize a bigger ratio of travel versus wheel travel than it would be if it's vertical. So... Okay. They've announced that the shock travel on these are going to be around 12 inches, 12 and a half inches, which should theoretically put them at about 25 inches of wheel travel. And he did use the um, coined term that Polaris did, uh, 25 inches of usable travel. So um, basically, you're going to be limited out on the machine on your suspension travel before you hit rock bottom. Um, and so when you're talking about 25 inches of wheel travel, 15 inches of clearance, um, you can, you can really expect, um, on the 35 inch tires that they've said that they're going to, or I'm sorry, 32 inch tires that they're going to launch with, um, you know, basically you're not going to bottom out the car unless you're, um, you're landing flat down off of a, uh, witch's eye or something. Which, which definitely happens as we've seen and experienced. <laughs> as we've seen. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about shocks. Um, <clears throat> sorry, I'm getting all sorts of congested today. Um, so they've continuing with the common parts methodology that they've done on their shot on their suspension. Um, they're using that in their shocks as well. So the entire shock body um, and piston or, um, uh, shafts and all that stuff are common on all four corners of the car. So um, you've seen a little bit of this happen in the UTV industry over the last couple of years. Um, when I had my first 2016 Turbo Polaris. Uh, the fronts were 2.5 inch shocks, the rears were 3.0 shocks, and I think that's the same on your car currently. You have 2.5s in the front and 3.0s in the back. Um, and so what they've done is they've actually gone to a larger shock, a three and a quarter inch internal bypass shock, and kept the internal, the the external housing and the shaft and all of that the same on all four corners. So you're actually going to get a three and a quarter inch shock on the front end, which is which is crazy. Um, which means that you're going to have a stoutness in your front end suspension that no one else has, period. Like, no one's even gotten close to that. No one has ever uh, launched a vehicle with three-inch shocks in the front. Uh, and going up to a three-and-a-quarter on all four corners is is pretty remarkable. Um, it's going to be a lot more expensive to do so uh, on their side. But three-and-a-quarter inch, um, they haven't specified the shaft dimensions. Um, but they're supposed to be, you know, a 12-and-a-half inch shock travel. I would assume you're probably going to be in the neighborhood of a one and three quarter, eh, one and a half inch shock uh, shaft, but um, they're going to have 360 clockable reservoirs. And the only difference on the four corners is going to be the internal valving and shimming, um, all the different spots that uh, allow the front travel to, to differ from the rear travel. 
Um, and then include dual rate springs, um, which is, in my opinion, something that they're probably not going to end up doing. They're probably going to end up going to uh, a dual spring setup, just like everybody else, just because of the economics of that. A dual rate spring is not cheap. Um, and the failure rate, as far as um, the, the burn rate on the manufacturing process, is a lot higher than on just having two dedicated spring rates that are, are crossed over. So that'll be super interesting. Um, and then also it'll have independent compression and rebound adjustments clickers on the shock. So they said that they're going to be the first in the industry to show that as a, as an option for their vehicles. Now <clears throat> there are cars that have dual, uh, settings, uh, like your car, Ian, I think has both compression and rebound on your Fox shocks. Uh, but you have to do that with some tools. You have to use actual, uh, shock tools to adjust those. You can't do them on the fly. Oh man. It's almost like motocross. Yeah. You have to get out of the car. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, they've they've said a little bit about the control system on the car having <clears throat> a 10 inch uh, touchscreen, um, the biggest one on in the industry, which by far 10 inches would blow everybody out of the water. But um, it doesn't make sense to me why they want it on such a high end vehicle, why they wouldn't go with an electronic control system. Uh, if they're planning on putting a full touchscreen and everything in this car, um, it just doesn't make sense to me that they wouldn't include Fox's IQS or um, the Bosch control system that everybody's using for these um, in some capacity because uh, it just in in a, in a consumer scenario you don't want to get out and have to control everything and that's why Polaris has been so successful with their Fox live valve integration into their Dynamics control right and that's why everybody's starting to follow up with upgrades that's why Shock Therapy is doing it that's why King's doing it that's why uh, Honda put them on their machines is because that convenience is a huge win for them. Um, I think it's an initial offering thing. You know, it, it's going to probably be something that maybe he develops down the road. I mean, if he were to put it on his car right now, just initial offering, you're probably talking $5,500, $5,000 is what's going to add to the cost of that vehicle. Yeah, you're looking at a couple to three grand per, you know, per front end Easily. or rear end Easily. to do that with the current offerings from, from Bosch and, and Fox and all that. So um, definitely going to be a huge price increase to do that. Uh, but what we've seen is from the OEs like Polaris and Honda and those guys, the increase in, in cost um, to the consumer on a, on, a, on a large scale manufacturing process is only about one and a half to two and a half thousand dollars uh, increase on the cost of the vehicle. And so on the manufacturing side, if you're doing it at scale, the cost isn't that great. It's just more of um, how are you going to market that and position it in the price point tier. Um, and uh, but I would suspect that's because of volume, uh, which Gordon's not going to have. And um, being a purist, he may not want to go that route just for the simple fact that he doesn't want anyone touching his, his suspension without him or the driver doing it themselves. And uh, to continue uh, through the suspension system, all four corners will all have the same uh, aluminum hubs. Uh, they're all going to have the same bearings. Um, you won't be able to replace bearings on the trail, so you'll have to have a press bearing on the hub, obviously, for, for physics reasons. Um, but they're going to all be common. So you, if you're out working on your machine, you'll buy four bearings all the same, put them into the, into the, um, into the hubs, and, and you're on your way. Um, the, all the bearings on the car are going to be booted. Again, we talked about no ball joints. Uh, something interesting he did say was that the, the CVs are going to be a high grade CV, but they're not going to be super compatible with high degrees of angle. So what he was basically saying is if you're cameraing your, your wheels and whatever for your racing scenarios or your driving style, um, for every five degrees, you're going to have to take five degrees off of your suspension travel just because the CVs won't put up with that kind of uh, extreme angle. So if you're thinking you're going to be buying a speed UTV car to make a, a, a mudder, uh, think again, because it ain't going to happen with their setup. Yeah, it's definitely not marketed towards that. So anyway, <laughs> it, <you laughs> yeah, know, there's, even there's no mudding in desert that, racing. Yeah, he, he did touch on that, that he, 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 he was kind of commenting on the fact that he built essentially a West Coast car a sand dune car, a desert car, and eh, we're on yeah, the West Coast. I, I have no problem with it. He, he's not really held any secrets on the fact that this car is 
is not an everybody car and that this car is definitely uh, targeted to those in the desert, the dunes, um, doing wide open, fast speed type stuff. This is an Ian car. (laughs) This is definitely an Ian car. It is. All right. So we had uh, talked about the 15 inches of clearance, um, the 25 inches of wheel travel. Uh, They've specifically called out that this will be a 35 inch wheel compatible car. Um, and so the, the rear of the chassis is already developed in a way that you can put 35s on it right away and it won't cause any problems with clearance. Uh, on the front end, he initially had said it'll clear 35s. Uh, this last video that he did, he specifically said <coughs> that 35s will clear after you trim the front plastics. Uh, he did say that they'll provide templates for that, but I think that was just an on-the-fly comment. I think they weren't really planning on supporting a 35 inch tire just logistically uh without you going through the effort of, of cutting your own plastic so um basically what his ex- his excuse I don't, I don't want to say excuse but his his reasoning behind this was that if you raise the plastics in the front of the car you're going to lose your side angles so uh as we've all experienced uh if you've had multiple machines uh seeing where your front end's going and seeing where your tires are is a huge deal and being able to understand the concept of where you are in space um, on your front end is a huge deal for anyone that's doing any obstacles. So, um, you know, me coming from a Polaris, I'm used to really great sight lines. You on, a, on your new Can-Am are noticing that you don't have the same sight lines you had on your YXZ. Uh, front sight lines are a big deal. And uh, on the Polaris Pro, uh, they said that they kept the, light si- the sight lines on their new vehicle, but... Uh, after launch, everybody said that they lost it, and it's a, it actually did. They lost a lot of sight angles on the Pro XP, um, and so that kind of customer confidence in, in being able to drive their vehicle, um, losing sight angle would be a huge deal, especially for off-road racing, and I can completely understand why they uh, kept the plastics low, um, and if you're putting 35s on your car, I would, and you're buying a Speed UTV uh, for that matter, um, I don't think you're going to be scared of trimming your plastics. Right, for sure. From the factory, they're going to be coming out with 32-inch tires on 15-inch rims. Um, It's supposed to be a 10-inch wide. And so that's going to be a huge win uh, there. But like like we said, on a Speed UTV, if you're investing in that, you're probably going to go a little bit bigger, maybe to a 33 or to a 35. Uh, But coming out with 32s is great. They haven't specified the model, um, the make and model of the tires yet. Um, I would assume they're going to either be Toyos or... Uh, or who's the other guy, Nito or um, Cam Threes uh, or something? BF Goodrich. Yeah, yeah, BF yeah. Goodrich probably. Um, you know, what's funny it, is you just literally touched on the three tires that I'm looking at putting on my car for <laughs> our uh, summertime overland adventures. I have the uh, the Trail Grabber, the the Toyo, and the KM3. Uh, KM3 is significantly cheaper than the other two, so I wouldn't be surprised if it winds up on uh, Robbie's car. It, it could happen. Yeah. Um, and so they've also said that on these uh, first round of cars, the limited edition cars, uh, you'll be getting uh, beadlock wheels, whereas on the production cars after limited edition has released, uh, they will be on a standard uh, non-beadlock wheel unless you upgrade it. Uh, moving into braking, they're going to be all slotted and vented brakes, uh, which is great. Um, all of the current modern uh, super sport cars, uh, they all have drilled uh, rotors right so uh having slotted will just be one more upgrade from there um they're going to do uh, in-house design calipers which is kind of interesting to me that they want to partner with um you know one of the bigger manufacturers on that brembo or willwood or somebody like right that. right and i think that comes down to margin i don't think they want to pay uh the margin at small scale that they're going to have to to face on that order um, it might just be cheaper to come out with your own simple design uh, and, and put it into production. We talked about the multi-point steering rack. Uh, the steering ratio uh, is going to be 1.75 to 1, which is more in line with like a speed doubler. Um, so that's going to be really nice to those guys that like to uh, race or have a lot of agility at high speed. Um, Ian. <laughs> or all of us. <laughs> I haven't had anyone complain that their car steered too fast. So no question. Yeah. Um, something we haven't really heard a lot about, uh, is the cabin comforts. Uh, the limited edition models will have a carbon fiber seat bucket, uh, along with a roof. 
uh, and a four point or four point harness slash five point harness. They'll give you the uh, disconnectable center uh, strap through the legs if you want to use it or not. Um, but the carbon fiber bucket seats in the roof are only on the limited edition models. Once you go to production past the first 500 or so, uh, they will go to an open cab, open roll cage format, and you'll have to buy the roof and, and whatever accessories you want there. Um, and, and again, uh, as it parts, as it pertains to that, uh, you know, if it shares any DNA with the two X, I, uh, being six, four, that car was actually the most comfortable car in the UTV market for me from a seating position, uh, the doors, everything I like. I really enjoyed the cabin riding in the 2X for sure. And if it if it kind of bears resemblance to that, uh, I think taller right. riders especially are going to like it. Yeah, I don't think there's going to be any problems with room or leg space or anything like that on these cars. Um, they have been really kind of showing that they're going to be capable of any person or any style of riding. So um, I'm not really worried about cabin uh, fit, but um, they haven't really talked about what's going into the cabin. I don't think you're going to see that until launch. I don't think you're going to know, you know, exactly what kind of seats you're going to have or what kind of plastic um, comforts you're going to have, like cup holders and things like that. Uh, I would suspect that the dash is going to be super simple, uh, super compatible with any kind of switching or GPS or anything like that you want to put on the car. Uh, whereas most manufacturers currently, the, the Polaris, the Can-Am, uh, the Honda, they, they all have very uh, detailed molds for their front dashes, uh, which means that you, to upgrade them to be compatible with any kind of navigation systems or things like that, you're really having to go very far out of your way to make that work versus just replacing it with a, you know, a flat panel dash. Um, so I, I foresee them coming out with something that's a little bit more compatible with upgrading and accessorizing. Um, and so I'm, uh, as, as weird as it sounds, I'm looking forward to a more simple flat dash from these guys than I am, you know, what has traditionally come to market. Yeah. Um, we talked about the, the harnesses. Uh, let's get into kind of some of the meaty uh, stuff that people have been waiting for. And that's the uh, drive uh, train, the engine and the transmission. So um, up to this point, they've been really hush-hush on it outside of just telling you they're going to have over 300 horsepower as an option. Uh, this last Wednesday, they did come out with some more details on the motor. So uh, we can go over that. But I first want to hit the transmission just because it's kind of a single point thing. They haven't really talked about the transmission yet. And I think that's for a reason. I think they, they've got something up their sleeve there. Uh, they have said that they're going to have a CVT uh, drive belt but the transmission itself, I think, is going to have some secrets to, to tell. So um, they, they glossed over a picture of the transmission uh, in their slideshow. So if you want to go look at their uh, second video they did on April 1st, um, there is a slide on there that you can watch him slide past real quick that he doesn't talk about. But it does show specifics about gearing that would need to be called out. So I'm super excited to see um, what that looks like. I am assuming that there's going to be a super low ratioed low end and a very, very capable high end, um, you know, um, high speed transmission gear setting. So um, being a racer, he's going to want to have basically the ability to miles drive. an hour. <laughs> exactly. He's going to be wanting to go hundred miles an hour through any terrain. And, um, on the low end, <clears throat> when you get to those obstacles, you need to be able to have as much torque as possible to get over those obstacles without any hesitation. So I foresee, uh, kind of like Can-Am did with their, um, with their RC vehicles that like you have, uh, that low gear is, is very low geared. Um, you know, it seems silly to say that to say the low gear is low ge lower geared than everybody else, but it, it sounded um, weird coming out. Yeah, you know? I, I've been known to do that. Um, but uh, I foresee them having some secret sauce in that transmission, uh, and I can't wait to see what that is. Um, moving on to the power plant, the engine that is being designed by Speed UTV in conjunction with a number of different. Um, engine uh, makers that he has relationships with. Um, he's come out and said that it's going to be a Speed UTV branded motor, a block and everything. Um, he's saying it's going to be a 999cc uh, four valve dual overhead cam, dual cylinder turbo engine, which is what we would all expect. A lot of people were expecting him to 
come out of the gate with maybe a Z1 platform or something that's like 1100 CC. But um, I don't think people realize that once you hit that leader, you are under a mountain of regulation. Specifically crash tests. Yeah, crash testing and um, also... Uh, what is that? Oh, also um, uh, the emission standards. Once you go over a, a liter, you have to abide by all the um, mile per gallon and emission uh, validation workflows that the government puts on automotive automotive makers. So you're not going to see that ever happen in the UTV market ever. Um, you're just which breaking. Is, you're just literally COVID's going around, and you're just breaking <laughs> hearts. I was hoping to give you some positive news today. Uh, there so. is none. <laughs> Christmas is canceled. Oh, no. I ruined everybody's lives. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you just in the UTV market, you're never going to see over a liter without them going to a full, uh, full-on full automotive spec vehicle. So um, the uh, being 99.9cc uh, uh, on a dual cylinder, um, I think is kind of interesting knowing that um, you know, Polaris has kind of maxed out what they could do on their dual cylinder. Um, Can-Am has gone to the triple um, and has been pushing up horsepower on the triple. I foresee there being, you know, maybe some supported third parties that do some big boring on those kits. Um, and I'm surprised that he didn't come out with a big bore. It may just be the simplicity of starting a new process, a new motor, a new company to put out a two cylinder is a lot easier than to do to do a triple. So I totally get that. Um well, in theory, you might be able to get a little bit more torque out of it, too. Maybe a longer stroke, you know, bigger right. bore, something of that nature. But that's all hypothetical, you know. Just from my personal experience, I, I going from a Turbo S to a, uh, like, driving a Turbo S and going to a Can-Am, you know, those are, you know, uh, it's not all gearing. Like, no. the Turbo S kind of comes out of the hole a little bit bigger because it has more power, like, right now. So, there's less lag. There's you less know, ramp a little up. more torque. Yeah, yeah. So, there, there's probably some advantages to that by by running with a twin. So, he's uh, specified that uh, this will be a 98 millimeter bore with a 66 and a quarter millimeter stroke. Um, I'm not specifically aware of what those numbers are for the competitors, um, but I'd be willing to, sp- willing to bet that, like you just said, it's going to have a lot of... Uh, impact on torque and high high rpm yeah the longer the stroke is the more torque it's going to have but the less revs that you have the shorter the stroke the higher it'll rev but the less torque that you have right i mean not necessarily the less torque it just makes it differently it's it's all up on the top end and like i said i'm not sure how that compares to the competitors but uh we'll definitely find that information and put it on our website that's something i'm curious about um he specified that they're going to have uh, 12 millimeter spark plugs which i believe is an automotive grade and sizing spark plug um, that you would see common in um, the off-road scene in baja and things like that Um, so the interesting thing is that uh, the the numbers everybody likes numbers and he said he's going to be around 230 horsepower um, on e91 fuel uh, and, and that's at 20 psi on the boost so um 20 psi is already a huge number uh, for the UTV market. Uh, but he also said that the entire fuel system, the fuel pump and everything is going to be compatible with moving to E85 right from the gate. So if you're looking to do E85 on any other, uh, Can-Am, Polaris, whatever, you're looking at doing not only the ECU tune, but you're also looking at the fuel pump and, uh, how it's all filtered and how it's all regulated. So, um, right out of the gate, you'll be compatible with E85 and, uh, on the, on the upgrade side, they're going to have um, an, a speed key. So if you're familiar with the X3s and their green and uh, what is it, gray keys, um, they they do uh, different. It's the it's the gray key and the worthless key is what it is. <laughs> yeah, gotcha. Yeah. Uh, and and so those two keys basically put the computer in two different modes, where one's a little bit more limited and one's a little bit more open. Um, with speed UTV, what their speed key does is actually unlocks the computer. So it's not an actual key that you drive with <clears throat> as what the name would kind of imply. It's not like the Can-Ams where it's a different key that you use to drive the machine. The key is more of an unlock to the computer. And what it does is it allows you to move to E85. It allows you to boost up to 30 PSI and supposedly will put out over 300 horsepower on E85. 
Now, these are all hypothetical numbers. We don't have a motor to prove that yet. Um, and we don't they, know how much uh, power loss is through that drivetrain as well, which could be substantial. You know, you're, you're dealing with anything from, you know, probably 22 up to like 33%. Right. And because for one, you still have a CVT, so your belt's going to limit you. But also what they've said is that their computer programming is going to on the fly uh, uh, adjust the horsepower and the torque uh, as you drive. So, um, you know, with all the current vehicles really? is that they have one program, they have one expected fuel, they have one expected expectation across the board. And so with his setup, something that's been overlooked a little bit is that he's ma- he's building a flex fuel car, which is a first in the right. ATV. So, but that, that's the first of I've heard of it, that it's computer control. It's almost like, I mean, it's not like a cam variable timing or anything like that, is it? Uh, no, because that's all uh, chain driven, right? Sure. But the, but the, the car itself uh, is going to have an infrared uh, belt uh, uh, sensor. So they're going to know what the belt temperature is. They're going to know what the engine temperature is. They're going to know the torque variables. They're going to know, you know, how much, um, how much you're abusing your machine. And uh, he specifically said the computer will limit the front and rear torque settings on the differentials. It will limit the amount of cranking force through the CVT. And it will on the fly mix the fuel depending on what it's getting through its sensors. So this, this motor is going to have all of the different exhaust and <clears throat> fuel sensors and and uh, all that stuff so if you're so that's really interesting because what it's doing is it's going to maximize per the fuel you're putting into it and the way you're driving it and so i foresee because their their cvts are going to be a very large cvt so if you look at the kawasaki and you look at the wildcat <clears throat> they have larger cf uh, cvts if you compare it to a, a can-am or a polaris they look huge in comparison and um, we recently reviewed the um, Savage UTV belt case. That case can't support the belts for those vehicles because the belts are so much longer. And uh, the, what that does is it allows your CVT to, to do less work because it has more grip. And the fact that they're going with the larger CVT, this unknown magic sauce in their transmission, I think some of that magic sauce is in relation to the computer control and the torque vectoring that they're going to be doing. So... Um, I foresee this being the biggest game changer out of this car. Uh, we've <laughs> talked a lot about the engine, or I'm sorry, the suspension. We've talked a lot about the chassis, uh, the shocks, the wheels, the hubs, everything like that. Those are all huge step forwards in, in this industry. The one that's going to be underrated right out of the gate is going to be the computerized engine control and torque vectoring. So uh, they haven't said torque vectoring as in like the normal term that you would associate with an Audi or something. But basically, I think that's what's going to end up happening is they're going to be able to control the torque from the engine to the transmission through the CVT, all of it. And they're going to be able to maximize the power delivery. And based off of the the way you key your your motor, if you unlock the, the, the computer on it, I think the third party tuning of these cars is going to be through the roof. Um, and being that fact that they're building an engine block from scratch there's nothing stopping them from building it thicker and bigger than it needs to be to allow bigger board a modification to the motor. They have certainly hope so. They also have specified that they're going to have forged pins, uh, forged pistons, cranks, and rods. They're going to have, um, a fly by wire system like everybody does. They're going to have, um, dedicated cooling ports for, uh, dedicated cooling for all the ports and, and plugs and things like that. So the entire top end of the motor should be a lot cooler. Um, they're going to have a rear mounted radiator, uh, to facilitate better, uh, front end, uh, geometry, uh, except for the, the HVAC model when that comes out, that's going to have a front mounted, uh, radiator just simply because of the, the dynamics of the airflow when you enclose a cab, um, and the, and the HVAC components of that. Um, so another thing that you'll be super interested in is they're going to have from the factory, a belt driven alternator putting out well over 150 uh, amps. Yeah, that's going to have to be standardized in this industry. I'm not saying it needs to be belt drive or anything like that. I know there's some aftermarket companies that'll put them into the drive line and all that stuff is uh, basically translates to a little bit of power loss. But, uh, you know, with the way that we accessorize these vehicles, it's going to have to become a little bit more standardized. Either that or 
Somebody's going to have to come through with some sta- uh, stator type technology that uh, really gets those things up, you know. Yeah, and you're seeing uh, um, well, OEs starting to, <clears throat> to react to that. I mean, Kawasaki's already got an actual OEM uh, alternator upgrade for their machines that everyone's doing. Um, and I foresee that the industry, the Pro, the, the Polaris Pro XP came out with a new um, higher output stator, right? Um, I, I foresee the industry adopting a much bigger stator for all their machines, if not a... Um, a new alternator system like like speed's doing yeah I, that I was actually one of the most undersold uh features on the new pro was yep. that new stator that was going to operate at 12 volts going to give you somewhere to operate around 70 some on amps give or take um whereas industry standard somewhere in the ballpark of about 50 which you can absorb and you can use up that 50 very very quickly yeah the i don't foresee the oes in the competitive market going to a belt driven unit um, I think that they'll simply just upgrade their stators to be around that like 95 amp range. Um, the the Polaris Pro's stator is already an upgrade, but I think there's a lot more room to upgrade. Uh, and if you're going to be checking off selling points against a competitor, there's no reason for you to try to reach for the sky. So um, especially with all the sound systems, light bars, you know, navigation systems, everything that people are putting on their cars, it just it doesn't make sense to have such a low uh, output stator. 75's got to be the basement moving forward, in my opinion. You know, that's coming from a battery guy, you know. That's coming from a battery guy that gets a lot of phone calls from people that don't know how to properly charge their gear and they're relying on their car to charge their gear after they've made a significant battery upgrade. It's not going to happen. You know, it's, I mean, to, to be, to be honest with you, it's that, that, that disqualifies you from a warranty from every battery manufacturer on the planet. Now, most battery right. manufacturers will actually play ball with you and take care of you, but if you, that, it's an abusive situation. So if you're in a situation where you're running your bat, or you, you take a 20 amp hour battery, which is very standard on a lot of these machines, and you upgrade it to a 44 amp hour battery, your stator isn't adequate enough to charge that thing up. So you go out time and time and time again, and you're, you're relying on your car to charge that up. It's not going to work efficiently. You have to charge that battery at least once per month and top it off. Otherwise, you're going to you're gonna affect the longevity. So guys will do this. And not only that, these cars have obscene amounts of parasitic draw. Tons. My Yamaha was no exception. It, had a, it would kill that battery. It wouldn't kill it. I could still start it. I could even start it down around 11 volts. But it does a substantial amount of damage to that battery. So this is something that the industry is going to have to take. Uh, very. It's going to have to get considered. We'll just go with that. Yeah, there's there's definitely kind of like this gray area when it comes to electronics that most owners of UTVs don't really fully understand. Um, not a really well educated segment of our market that you know maybe we could work together on. Uh, but right. the 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 dynamics of a vehicle and how it performs in conjunction with how much power it's drawing versus putting back. A lot of people don't even understand that that exists, let alone that it's an issue. Um, right. But people like Gordon, who is in racing, right? That's one of the very first places you can really realize the issues electronically with a car is the fact that you can you can outrun your electronics. Um, and so you can go further and faster than your car can support and eventually draw that battery down to nothing. So um, I foresee them coming out with, you know, when we're talking about batteries, uh, a, a battery solution that's not typical for the industry, something that's maybe third party at a higher quality level, um, maybe something in re- relation to like what you guys develop at Full Throttle. Um, I'll get on it. I, I think you could uh, speak some knowledge over to their side and maybe get a win. Um, but uh, the the output of, a, of an alternator is going to definitely help fulfill those needs when it comes to battery life. Um a couple of things I didn't talk about yet. Um, this is not going to be your typical uh, four-wheel drive UTV uh, in relation to like um, basically everybody except for the newer Can-Ams has an all-wheel drive on-demand type computer-controlled four-wheel drive to the front end uh, differential. So uh, basically your, your front end doesn't do anything until it recognizes that it's slipping and then it engages the front diff. Um where speed UTV is going to be going the the route of um, uh, on the fly lockers, which I thought was a really interesting uh, spec. Uh, something that a lot of guys that do things like King of Hammers or Mints or anywhere where you have to navigate uh, big obstacles and and things like that, um, not getting out of the car to do on the fly uh, locking is a huge deal. 
Um, we talked about having the fact that getting out and changing your shocks uh, settings is a big deal. Getting out and having to do like locking hubs is a huge deal in the off-road world when we talk about off-road trucks. Um, and so having an on-the-fly four-wheel drive uh, is a huge deal, especially because like when you compare it to the automatic drive that Polaris and everybody else has, you have to slow down to under five miles an hour for that four wheel to engage in the first place, let alone for it to actually recognize you're slipping and, and start throwing it into to front wheel drive. So that, that was something that I really appreciated about my Yamaha. I could go in and out under power, yep. you know, and it wouldn't, I mean, like you do that on my Can-Am and you're going to hear a bang, boom, clang. Like you can, you can change it on the fly, but you, you better not be under power. If anything, even kind of a good rule of thumb that I do. I don't, I don't, I'm not even compression braking when I switch that thing in, in and out. I am under uh, even throttle, just keeping things really nice and smooth. But yep. on the Yamaha, it would do it at its, at its leisure. Like you would flip that thing in and it would switch when it determined there was an opportune time to do it, you know, right. and you would just watch that gauge on real time up on your dash. So that was, and that the, would it, be something that I would really like to see improved in the industry for sure. Cause uh, when you're going from pavement onto gravel, you want to be able to switch that and not have to, you know, come down to a stop or, or something of that nature or even just hard packed dirt to loose silt or, or sand right and the the thing about it is like all the competitors all the mainstream oes their front diffs all have plastic parts in their fronts so that's why they limit you via the computer to even change it is just because they understand the limitations of the product and uh going to a, a delivery of an on-the-fly uh uh, basically a gear change in the front diff, right? Um, right. Is a huge win for them that no one else is going to be able to compete with. So overall, um, you know, there's a lot of details still left to, to come. Uh, there's a lot of discussion you could have on chassis design and angles and, and all that kind of stuff. I think that would be really fun, but really boring for a podcast. But I thought this would be a great <laughs> uh, introduction to the Speed UTV details that have come out from Gordon himself um, and kind of speak to a new player in the industry with a whole completely different focus. Uh, this right. is not like... Um, <clears throat> this isn't like uh, Segway coming to market with a, a new hybrid setup and everything else is exactly the same. Um, this isn't like um, Can-Am coming out with their, their their locking front diff. This is literally somebody coming to the industry with a completely different approach. Um, and so I think there's a lot of really cool stuff to learn here. Um, a lot of cool insight into how uh, speed side-by-side -side and UTV works, how, got, how Robbie Gordon thinks. Um, he does have a very, uh, I, I guess you could say a, an abrasive personality when he confronts uh, questions and things like that. But um, it'll be really interesting to see if this this car does come to, to market and, um, you know, really how much of this race experience that he has actually translates to an actual physical product that people can buy. He's the Bill Belichick of off-road. <laughs> <laughs> so, Yeah. Um, I'm super excited to just see if it actually comes to market again. You know, you asked me earlier about where my stoke level is on this. Um, I'm still in the middle, still on the fence, uh, on the actual product, um, until it comes out. Uh, once it comes How out, how excited are you going to be when I send you a selfie from one of his cars at the sand sports show in <laughs> September? I think I'll have to be there is what I'm thinking. Yeah, well, you should be, I mean, yeah, assuming, <laughs> Let's assuming say this virus thing doesn't keep us out of it, but uh, yeah. Well, they might have to uh, move the event to a large field to spread everybody out on. <laughs> yeah, everybody yeah or either away. that or, you know, move it move it into February or something like that. I, I, I don't want to, yeah, I want that event to go off. That's a great event. That's a great event for us. That's a great event for the industry. It's actually the industry, our industry is SEMA, essentially. Basically, yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah, anyways, I'm super excited to see another competitor. I'm excited to see new technology and different approaches. Um, and hopefully, uh, like we've talked about, this just drives our industry forward, drives the OEs to do better and to put out um, more capable and um, interesting products. Uh, a lot of these different design decisions um, would be a huge win for someone like Can-Am to eat away more at Polaris or um, Yamaha to come out with a new game changer, uh, that they severely need. Um, so come on, Yamaha, <laughs> my goodness. Well, you know, what's interesting is we've speculated before about Yamaha possibly putting out a new machine this year. 
Um, it'd be really interesting to see if they actually do with, with how the, um, the Corona thing has, has gone off and, and changed, uh, workflows and development in, in companies putting out products. So, um, yeah, my wish list within the next three years is another sport platform from Yamaha and a sport offering from Suzuki. I, uh, I've, I've bragged multiple times on this show that I am not a brand honk, but as it becomes, as it comes to dirt bikes, I grew up on RMs, Suzuki RMs and, uh, they always carved a little better than the other bikes that I would ride, and uh, I really would love to see Suzuki come to the market with a UTV. I think it would be very unique, no question about it. So, so here's a um, here's a hypothetical: what if? What do you think about this idea thing? What if because the Polaris RS1 has kind of taken over a lot of the racing short course stuff? What if Suzuki came out with a single seat? Short course slash dune focused machine. Stop. <laughs> I think I think they would be uh, in a unique position to come out with a unique vehicle and not upset anybody by doing it. If, if they uh, did that, if they did that, there would be a Can Am X3 RC for sale. <laughs> uh, it would be very interesting to see somebody compete with Polaris on the single seat market. Um, you know and. I don't think you could do that without uh, some sort of corporate justification unless you were coming into the market for the first time. Right. Um, and right. so somebody like Kawasaki or Suzuki uh, could very well say, hey, well, let's take all the development we've put into these dirt bikes and put it into a single seat, fully roll caged, basically version of it with a completely different transmission that supports that kind of racing. Um, and it just doesn't make sense for me why Suzuki hasn't come out with anything because of all the Japanese OEs, they're kind of the gambler. They're kind of the risk taker, you know, like when the LTR came out, the LTR was, it was lower and wider than the other, uh, than the other quads. Uh, they're the first ones to bring fuel injection into motocross. They were the first ones to bring in the air fork, which, you know, the air fork didn't work out, but they're willing to take those gambles. And, uh, yeah, I just think in the side-by-side -side industry, and I've heard quotes from their, their upper-level management that they think that UTV is a fad. And if they still think that, then, you know, they're obsolete. They're dinosaurs at this point. But I would you know, I mean, argue we, they already are, but, you know. Well, yeah, I mean, when you look at their operating capital, they have the means to make an investment and get into this game. They absolutely do. Like, when you look at, when you look at their financials, it, it's they're an impressive company, you know, just because their automotive line and stuff like that didn't really function very well in the United States. I mean, worldwide and globally, they're off the charts. They make a lot of money. Yeah. They have a lot of, uh, of coverage in the manufacturing side and, uh, like fulfillment side, um, box trucks, forklifts, um, all sorts of different stuff. And those are used worldwide in high numbers. And so they're not, they're not shying away from the fact that they're a big company, um, but I think that's exactly what would allow them to win. Now, if you compare that to what their actual return on investment would be, um, I don't foresee them actually pulling the trigger on that because they're they're already making so many so many more dollars in other areas that potentially this, that this wouldn't really hit their their revenue stream that that much. Now, that being said, if they're trying to change the face of their company and they're trying to become younger and more uh, modern and current, um, I could see them doing an investment into the side by side industry. Uh, with a with a big marketing campaign and things like that, but I don't foresee them doing it unless they're they're really trying to change face. We'll see. Like I said, a guy can wish. It would it would definitely be intriguing, no doubt about it. And if it, uh, you know, if it, if it was the shot across the bow that the LTR 450 was, or that the 05 uh, RMZ 450 was. Uh, Actually, no, it wasn't the 05. Uh, well, the the 05 RMZ 450 was pretty innovative. It was it was it, it came out with a four speed. Uh, the industry was five speed at the time, and the way that those gears were gapped. I mean, honestly, from an ergonomic standpoint, I've never been on a bike. Mind you, I'm six foot four. I've never been on a bike that was more comfortable than that vintage. And then you know, you fast forward a few years after that, they came out with fuel injection, and uh, you know, a lot of people don't know it, but <clears throat> Suzuki makes motors for a lot of the other o OEs. You know, I mean, Kawasaki and Suzuki have swapped motor technologies a number of times. And, uh, you know, I've kind of always considered Kawasaki and Suzuki to be, you know, you know, I'd share some, share some similar DNA. We'll just go with that. You know, I, I, I just think that the more, the, the more offerings that come into this industry, the better. For sure. Now, 
speaking about motors that uh, or, or synergies between companies like that, I have a new theory in the side-by-side -side world. You want to hear it? Go for it. Yamaha does a lot of motor development for Arctic Hat slash Textron. So does Suzuki. And all of their current snowmobiles, all of their current side-by-sides are all running Yamaha uh, motors, I believe. And almost all of the Yamaha sleds and uh, a lot of their vehicle development is being done by Arctic Hat. So if you take that fact where A and B mix with C and D and become a full alphabet soup of products and Textron dropping the ball on the Arctic Hat brand severely, uh, Arctic Hat not really doing much, Textron not really doing anything, and them changing face from Textron back to Arctic Cat on the Wildcat uh, UTVs and such. And you, and you look at how uh, Yamaha just came out with a new sled, uh, which is an identical twin to the um, Arctic Cat Alpha series. Um, they basically are, everything is, is becoming almost identical. So with the idea that Textron really doesn't care about Arctic Cat from any kind of visible standpoint, and Yamaha needing to change the game on a new vehicle. I have a theory that within the next couple of years, either Yamaha buys Arctic Cat from Textron or Textron spins it off and, and gives the IP to Yamaha. Hmm. So if you take That's that, <laughs> if you take the idea of the Wildcat basically aging itself out, and you take the YXZ basically aging itself out. It's a it's a prime time and opportunity for those two companies to either break ways and and make a large investment in a rejuvenation of the brand, or to merge their brands somehow and become one bigger brand that then comes out of the gate with a huge game changing vehicle. And to and to get away from Gordon's patents on the Wildcat. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Like I said, I, it would it would definitely make our job a lot easier. To have something <laughs> to talk about for sure. Uh, I mean, if, if you were if you were to talk about, I mean, because because I was thinking about this when I was thinking about Robbie Gordon's patents on the Wildcat and why the Wildcat has fizzled because there's been no aftermarket support for it. Um, they basically have to reinvent the car again. They have to come out with a whole new platform. And Yamaha has been sitting on a, on a new platform, not coming out with anything. And it's the perfect time for those two companies to work together to come out with something awesome. Right. That we know of. Yamaha, the rumor's been Yamaha's had a trick up their sleeve for a while, but we still haven't heard anything. Yeah. So anyways, that's my new conspiracy theory to throw out into the side-by-side the -side world. Everyone can take that for what it is and uh, run with it. Create some memes. It'd be fun. Yeah. Um, but, uh, speed UTV. Yeah. Lots of interesting things happening. If you want to find out more about what they're doing, go to, uh, speed side by side .com, um, or, uh, their social channels. And like I said, they're doing uh, live videos every Wednesday. I don't know if that's going to continue every Wednesday until launch, but for right now, that's what they've said. Um, and, uh, that's at 7 PM Eastern. Uh, and so check that out follow along with them we have a article going on our website that has all the rundown on specifications of the 4x and the following models so if you want to uh, have one place where you can see all the specs uh, without any kind of fluff uh, we'll have a page there for that and uh, yeah looking forward to the change looking forward to getting outside and breathing some fresh air uh, in the mountains what do you think uh, it's long overdue. You know, it sounds like, uh, what's today? April's, well, yeah, we covered this earlier. It's April 3rd, I believe. Um, I'm supposed to have my car back in about three weeks. And as long as everybody's healthy and stuff like that, uh, hopefully you and I can go down there and pick that guy up and kind of log that whole process, get our hands on it and get it back here. Get the, I've got a uh, whole bunch of Baja designs lights here to put on that car. I've got some rugged radio components showing up. We've got a battery upgrade to do. We've got more stuff to do to that car and you can shake a stick at. And uh, I think I speak for you as well that uh, we're really looking forward to it. It'd be really nice to be able to get back to some sort of normalcy here real soon. 
I need to I need to smell some pine trees and some fresh uh, creeks and uh, some dust. Uh, Absolutely. I've never, I've never felt so off put by the idea that I want to go smell some dust. So. Yeah, uh, we have an, a not an event, but we actually have a ride scheduled uh, coming up before Memorial Day, and with Washington on lockdown until May fourth, you know that's about three weeks after that. I'm really hoping that we're able to pull that off. You know, it's going to be up in a very desolate area, isolated. So I don't really see us having any sort of issue getting up there. Uh, I don't really see it being too intrusive for us to be up there and ride. But it'd be great to get some miles on that car. The biggest thing will be if the Forest Service actually goes and unlocks all the gates, or if they just get to it. Where we're going, there are no gates, my friend. <laughs> I can you? I can assure you of that. There are some gates up there uh, that that co- uh, close off some access points that close up some linked roads, but we know how to work around all that stuff. I mean, you're not talking about going around gates. We're talking about uh, just um, staying on the open areas. So it's right. going to be a lot of fun. Well, cool. Well, this has been fun talking about uh, and seeing the changes and details coming out with this vehicle. Uh, excited to see what the future holds. And uh, I'm looking forward to getting out and out and about with you. Um, well, and I'm certainly looking forward to doing the recording back in the studio because uh, in the two hours that we've been recording this show, um, we have I have two daughters that refuse to be quarantined to their room any longer. I had a 14-week-old puppy pee on a bed. Um, so, yeah, chaos has ensued at the, uh, at the Blomgren household right now. <laughs> so... <laughs> Well, I can't wait to have you back in the studio and uh, yeah. and maybe some other people as well. So uh, we got a, a lot of interesting episodes coming up here soon, a lot of changes and a lot of more content coming your way. So make sure to subscribe to Side by Side Guides on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube. Uh, we have a contest going on right now. So by the time you hear this, there'll be about a week left on that contest. Uh, if you go to SideBySideGuys.com or go to our Facebook.com slash SideBySideGuys, there's a sweepstakes tab there for you to enter to win a Savage UTV belt case. Um, it is the latest version, brand new from Savage UTV. So uh, every time you go to one of the steps of entry to visit one of our websites or like one of the websites, you get an entry into that contest to win a brand new Savage UTV belt case. So make sure to do that. Make sure to like and subscribe. And uh, until the next one, Ian... We'll you talk. know, real, real quick, I got to tell you, the feedback I've been getting on the shows, the direct messages, I, I'm getting feedback from people that know nothing about UTV. They're just into the show because they they, they want to get involved. And uh, I, I mean, you're talking about friends that I've had for years and stuff. They know nothing about off-road. They know nothing about UTV, but they're getting involved with the show. So the, the thing I would recommend to people is uh, get more involved. Send us some messages. Talk about what you want to talk about. I mean, we do this because we're really passionate about the industry, but we also do this because we do it for the industry for you guys so if there's something you want us to talk about if there's something that we're not covering if there's something that uh anything reach out to the show get involved yeah we we really would like to hear your perspective on the podcast and the content and the content we create outside the podcast the videos and the website and all that stuff we want to know what you want we want to know what you're interested in and what things are affecting you and what obstacles are you having to to overcome with your machines and uh in your industry in your your locales like are you on the oregon coast are you on the on the california coast where people are trying to shut shut down the sand dunes are you on the east coast where um you know some places are actually getting opened up are you southeast where uh in florida or maybe in utah where places are opening up utvs to the streets um we'd like to hear back from you guys and know what kind of topics you want us to discuss and and go over so uh, definitely want to hear back from you guys and we want to hear uh, your feedback on what we're currently doing uh but even more so what you want us to do so yeah send us a dm send us an email uh like and subscribe so that you can participate in the comment threads and uh yeah we're we're, we're bringing brands on we're bringing personalities on that everybody's gonna be super interested in and um hopefully uh they're the people you're interested in so uh, we want to know that until you talk to us and uh so yeah send us a dm um and let us know uh what your thoughts are the less we get exposed to this garbage the quicker we can put it behind us hopefully everybody's staying safe and staying healthy out there yeah don't don't ignore the rules they're there for a reason it's making an impact and it takes all of us to overcome this thing so uh stay stay safe stay stay isolated as much as possible uh try to hang in there as long as you can we're going to get through this and uh we're we're going to be better because of it so um 
uh, yeah, looking forward to, to having you in the studio. Uh, looking forward to having all your smiling faces at events and seeing everybody and talking with everybody. So until the next time, uh, guys, hang in there and uh, we'll be back for episode 13. Peace. Peace.